All right. Thank you all for joining us. Just give a few more minutes for everybody to log in and get into the meeting. Just thank you for joining us. My name is Shakira Regoza. I'm the Farm Service Agency Technical Assistant here at Young Farmers Coalition. We have a nice program for you. We're going to talk about FSA loans and hear from other BIPOC farmers about their process they went through to secure their FSA loans. So we're just going to make sure everyone's got a chance to join in. If you have any technical issues, please list them in the chat and we'll assist you right away. We'll be looking out for those. Thank you for joining us. So I wanted to mention that we are working in part with a uh, Rafa USA, which is Rural Advancement Foundation International. So we're thankful for their partnership and working with us on providing you this technical assistance for FSA. We're going to go ahead and, and get started now. Like I mentioned, my name is Shakira Regoza. And just a little bit of housekeeping for this meeting. Please stay on mute for the whole webinar. We will have a Q&A session at the end. So please save your questions or put them in the chat and we will um, address those when it's time. This webinar is being recorded and it is also being live streamed on Facebook and the recording will be available to you after the meeting. Okay, so as you come in, please take a moment to put your name in the chat, introduce yourself, your farm, where you're calling from, and you can also include what you grow. As I mentioned before, please put your microphones on mute. If you have any questions, please place them in the chat or the Q&A box, and we'll get to those when it's time. Okay, so this webinar is offered by the National Young Farmers Coalition, NYFC, and RAFA USA, Rural Advancement Foundation International. A little bit about Young Farmers. Um, young Farmers is an intersectional coalition that works for justice and collective liber liberation of our food and farm systems. We champion policies that resource connections to the land and foster our health in the face of climate crisis. We advocate for policies that recognize farming as a public service. We also work in partnership with social justice movements for a future in which people, land, and relationships are respected. I'm going to take some time um, to introduce uh, Ms. Lisa Mish with uh, Rafa USA, and she'll talk a little bit more about her organization. Lisa? Yeah, hi, everyone. Good to be here today. Um, like Shakira said, my name is Lisa Mish, and I'm the Managing Director of Programs at Rafa USA. Uh, for those who haven't heard of us, we're uh, an agricultural nonprofit based in North Carolina um, with programs around the Southeast and also doing policy work on a national level. Uh, but our mission is challenging root causes of unjust food systems and advocating for sustainable, equitable, just food systems. Um, some of our notable programs that I wanted to highlight um, were our Farmers of Color Network. Um, which includes some grant funds and um, special programming and training for farmers that identify as farmers of color. Uh, we also have a farmer hotline, which is always open if a uh, farmer is experiencing um, financial crisis or you had a loan denial or you know, some other um, issue where you could use help from an advocate. Um, and then we also have a special program called Resources for Resilient Farms which is really focused on helping farms, farmers navigate different federal program processes like FSA loans. Um, we also provide support around NRCS programs um, and our, our website's listed on the slide here if you'd like to learn more. All right, thank you so much, Lisa. So who's on the call today? Um, like I mentioned, my name is Shakira Regoza. I am the National Young Farmers Technical Assistant. So I help farmers completing FSA loan applications. And we also have on the call Ms. Ebony Stevenson. Uh, shout out to Ebony. She's our USDA Access and Accountability Organizer. Ebony, would you like to share a little bit about what you do? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, can everybody hear me okay? 
Awesome. So uh, my name is Ebony Stevenson. I'm the USDA Access and Accountability Organizer here at Young Farmers. Um, I work directly with Shakira. Um, we provide technical assistance with farmers who are interested in accessing credit from the USDA through any of the loan programs that the FSA offers. And so we work one-on-one -on -one with farmers uh, to walk them through the process and provide any technical assistance they need all the way from the beginning to downloading the forms, uh, figuring out how to uh, navigate the farmers.gov website, the materials um, and documents that they need to submit their paperwork, and even helping them get assistance to get their farm number. And also we do um, technical assistance uh, if there's any issues with local offices. Uh, something else that we also um, focus on is um, we work with farmers who do, during this process feel that they have experienced discrimination from the USDA, uh, whether from the FSA or the NRCS. And so we help elevate those complaints so that you know, BIPOC farmers truly can get access to these resources that other farmers already have access to. And so that's me. Um, and my email is listed on the screen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ebony. And last but not least, we have Mr. Otis Wright Jr. with Rafi USA. Would you like to introduce yourself, Otis? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Otis Wright Jr. I am uh, I serve as farmer resource coordinator. Um, I mainly focus on FSA loans. So any questions you might have about FSA, um, I do my best to answer them. I can help you with cash flow, balance sheets, all of those things that make up that FSA application. So uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email is listed and uh, you can use that and I'll get back to you uh, ASAP. Thanks for having me. Look forward to speaking with you. Awesome, thank you. Okay, also, we have some very special guests with us today that we appreciate their time coming in. They are producers like you and um, myself who know that we have um, a lot on our plate. So we appreciate them coming in and spending some time with us this afternoon. Our first farmer panelist is Mr. Matthew Ramon from Shunshan's Bounty. And we also have Rachel and Stu James Stewart with Stewart Pastures and Mr. Tim Davis. We won't introduce our farmer panelists just yet. We'll let them introduce themselves right after a brief overview on FSA loans. So our agenda for today, I just wanna give you a brief background on FSA loans, especially if you're not aware of what are the options and how FSA works. We'll try and make this short so we can get to the most important part that you're probably here for is to hear about other farmers and their experiences with these programs. So we'll have a panel discussion followed by the question and answer section. All right, so who is FSA or what is FSA? FSA is a branch of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Their mission is to equitably serve all farmers and ranchers, partner through a delivery of service of efficient agriculture programs for all Americans. So simply put, they exist to provide economic stability to farmers and ranchers. Okay, so FSA offers in low interest loan loans to help family sized farmers and ranchers meet their farm needs when banks and other lenders cannot offer financial assistance. FSA loans can be used to purchase or expand a farmer ranch for construction or improve farm buildings. It can cover your operating costs, family living expenses, conservation practices and help you rebuild and recover after emergencies. So there are a lot of good um, programs out there to help farmers. Just a little bit of information about different loan types. If you like to work directly with FSA, meaning you go through their office and complete the application process with them, you can apply for a direct loan, but they also offer what is called a guarantee loan, meaning that if you feel more comfortable working with a traditional bank, you can go in and speak with them. And if they find that your credit history or your financial history is a little bit weak, then they can reach out to FSA to back your loan. So they are actually guaranteeing payment on your loan. So you work with a local bank instead of directly with FSA. So that's a little bit about the two different loan options through Farm Service Agency. 
and they have various programs as you can see there's a long list here i won't go into many of them um, but i will share another resource that's available that'll go into more details about each loan program um, that'll be available in the chat for you as well to get some more information about these but as you can see there's there's quite a few available so what does a farmer have to do to get access to these loans this is these are the basic eligibility requirements listed here now each program might have additional requirements but these are very basic ones for um, each one that's spread out through each one so you will need to be a u.s citizen or a legal resident you must be 18 years of age and able to make financial decisions for yourself and not have any convictions for growing controlled substances and you must have a farm business plan that shows that you're able to repay the loan and reasonable credit history you don't need perfect credit history to apply it just needs to show that you have um, paid made payments frequently and on time in the past and if there was an issue in your credit then they will look into that and see um, if they can still lend to you maybe there was a time without employment that you couldn't make payments and you fell behind so they understand those situations so you don't have to have perfect credit but just um, a good payment history and some other things to consider when you're applying for loans they will ask you to put up some type of collateral so you'll need um, either in the form of what you're purchasing like equipment or land or something else you have other assets that you can put up for collateral and you also need to be willing to follow the conservation practices of nrcs and they might ask you for um, crop insurance on your crop and there's a few more here like i mentioned we won't go into the specifics on each one because we are short on time and we want to get to those farmer panelists but the main ones that are most interest, I think, that apply more to beginning farmers would be the microloan program, which is under $50,000 for buying or purchasing. And those programs, the applications are usually a bit shorter and more accessible for beginning farmers. There's also the operating loan program to buy equipment and tools and supplies that you need for the year to get started. And then the last one is the ownership loan program for purchasing land or major construction or infrastructure um, uh, building. So here's that great resource I want you all to check out. Um, we'll try and make sure we get this to you in the chat um, before the end of the webinar. But this is information on FSA loans. It's a great webinar that um is placed uh by rafi and i think lisa and otis are both on that one so this is a really good resource i encourage you to check out to get all the details about those fsa loans so i'll leave that there if you want to jot it down i'll try and get that in the chat for you in a bit here are some things to consider as you're looking into applying for loans, what type of paperwork do you need? Do they need your tax returns? That all depends on your business and if you're filing Schedule Fs or not. Um, will they ask for your tax ID? Yes, if you have a business entity, an LLC, you can also apply for these loans. Um, so they might request your business structure, your articles of incorporation. If you've been farming for three years, they will ask you what your production history is or how much income you have from farming. What are your expenses? Um, if you have a business plan, do you have a market for your product? Those are some things that you'll like to consider before you um, start the application process. And they also request that you have some farming experience with um, these. And so those can be in the form of an internship or volunteer work, or if you are managing your own farm, or if you have a background or secondary education in farming, all of those things can help you qualify for the eligibility uh, managerial experience um, section. And if you have questions on any of these things, please reach out to us. Um, we're here to uh, assist.
Okay, so this is a really brief overview of the FSA loans. Um, first, you want to spend some time, like I mentioned, getting all your documents prepared, and then you will submit your application to the FSA, and they will give you a receipt for your service, which um, they'll let you know that you had a complete application, that they received your documents. And usually it's a bit longer than a traditional loan to get from application to approval. They have 60 days to get back to you. And then after that time, um, they will do assessments, appraisals, and you should have a closing um, pretty soon after that 45 days. And once your loan is approved, you'll have the funds available in 15 days. So that's just a, a timeline for you to see how the FSA works. I know I'm moving through this pretty quickly, so um, let us know if you have any questions and um, we can help you. Otis is also available to help with uh, FSA loan processes and also RAFA USA. If you get an application back and you're not comfortable with the decision or you don't agree or don't understand the decision letter, which could be an approval or needing more information or a denial, in those situations, we're here to help you too to understand what are the next steps. There's also a hotline if you would like to call directly to um, Rafa USA Farmer Hotline. If you feel like you were unfairly denied a loan, maybe they misunderstood your application, didn't understand your operation, um, or if, the, if you experience discrimination, you can reach out through this number. Also, Ebony is also here to assist with that um, unfair denial uh, process. All right, so I know that was really quick. Um, if you have questions, like I mentioned, please reach out to us. We are going to be starting our formal panel right now, just checking in here if there are any questions. Okay, so we will try and get all this information out to you um, and a recording will be made available. So please keep those questions coming. We're going to switch now to the farmer panelists. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we're going to get to hear from these great farmers that we have that have gone through this process themselves and talk about um, how it went for them. So first up, we have uh, Mr. Matthew Ramon from Texas, Sunshine's Bounty. As we come to our farmers, we're gonna ask them if they can please just give an overview of your farm, um, what you're growing and where you're at. So Matthew, I'll give the time over to you. Howdy, um, my name is Matthew Ramon. I'm here in uh, Palmview, Texas. Um, my farm's name is Sunshine's Bounty. We've uh, started growing back in 2017. Um, it's just me and my wife. It's a, it's a small quarter acre urban farm uh, that we've been running. Uh, but we, we've we been wanting to grow our farm. So we, we found a, a property and we used the farm ownership alone to, uh, to, to find a new place. So that's uh, who we are and what we've been up to. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you for being here. Now we'd like to hear from Rachel and Stu. Hi, we are Stuart Pastures. I'm Rachel Stewart. Um, this is Stu. Uh, we are on 150 acres. We raise goats, sheep, our, uh, goat sheep, hogs, um, ducks, and more. Um, also sometimes cattle, but mainly um, mainly goats and sheep. And we are expanding to um, add a processing facility and 40 acres, and that should be um, in April. And we went through the direct, um, Mr. Stewart went through the direct farm ownership loan. Oh yeah, um, actually I'm a second time going through it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Wow, lots of great experience. We look forward to hearing from you all. And then next we have uh, Tim Davis.
Hi, this is Hi, this is Tim Davis. Can you hear me? We can. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Can, you guys can hear me? Yes, sir. Hey. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I'm calling off-site in Lynchburg, Virginia, so uh, my receptivity is really bad. Uh, my name is Tim Davis. I, I own and operate Timmy Family Farm out of Ansonville, North Carolina. We are a vegetable farm. Uh, my farm is a new farm within itself. Uh, my family farm, uh, the Davis farm, has been around since post-slavery, post-Civil War era which is about 80 acres. And my farm is a transition to a separate operation. Uh, and it's gonna be a total vegetable farm. Uh, I'm looking at seven CSA. We look, right now we're growing tomatoes, hot pepper, sweet peppers, basil, cucumber, squash, zucchini, okra, carrots, collards, and a bunch of herbs. And we sell at farmer's market up in uptown uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And I use the, uh, farm ownership loan, equipment loan, and also the operating loan program to FSA. Thank you, Tim. So we have a, a, a variety of range of uh, farm programs represented here. So we look forward to learning about each of those. Um, I know, did we, Matthew, could you share what loan did you apply for? Um, we applied for the farm ownership loan, and we, uh, okay. we purchased 12 acres. Awesome. Great. So, Matthew, what was your experience applying for the loan, and did you face any barriers, and how did you overcome them? Um, the experience was, was, some of it was good, some of it was bad. Um, was a lot to learn and I'm glad we could experience and, and uh, learn the process of, of, uh, of, of doing one of these loans so that now when we were gonna go back and do it again for something else, we, we know what to expect. Um, I, I think one of the biggest barriers uh, for us is there wasn't necessarily instructions that came with the forms, right? So some of them were, were very confusing or, and um, you know it, they all kind of depended on what your operation was and, and what you were doing with the loan is how you filled out the form. Um, so the way we got past that is, is uh, well, I called anyone and everybody I knew that uh, had applied for the loan or, or gave assistance in filling out the loan. So it was lots of phone calls, lots of visits. Um, we also would go down to our local FSA office with a list of questions and specific forms. Uh, whenever we were kind of at a point where we didn't know what to do. Oh, thank you. So I hear just reaching out for help, basically. Just Number everywhere one. and everywhere. That's take home. All right, thanks. Rachel and Stuart, um, how was your experience and did you have any barriers that you had to overcome and how did you do that? Uh, so my, my experience was long and drawn out. Um, the biggest issue I had was just not understanding that a farm service loan is not like any other loans and like the differences between, cause uh, you do, uh, I've done loans and have plenty of experience with this. So when we talk about that, I'm very well versed, but then there's different things that they do that's not typical, like uh, your household expenses. You need to know to put your household expenses in. So these are things that create denials out of lack of knowledge. So you can easily, if just knowing you put your household, it, it's it, at the end of the day, it's a business plan. So you, you're supposed to create your business plan to succeed. If you, I mean, there's no way you're not going to create it to have a positive at the end. You find out your your levels. Uh, another thing is, so you you need contracts or you need to go and you need to make sure that you can find the uh, actual market value of the products that you choose to do. That's gonna be a big help for you as far as getting approved, knowing what you're going in, because you're gonna go in what you know you're gonna sell it for, but what you're gonna sell it for don't really mean that. You need to go with market value. Uh, that does two things for you. One, you know what you're gonna sell it for, but two, it, it sets your, your baseline at a more realistic place and it's lower 
So it gives you all the opportunities. You're going to set everything and base everything off market value. And you might be making three, four dollars extra per sale. But your business plan is not going to state that. So that's going to be a benefit to you by going down to what they're looking for, as opposed to just it's all your expectations. So um, and just getting those pieces of knowledge about what they're looking for and, and how to go through that process. Then after that, the second time, I mean, you, you already know what to do. So, you know, I, oh, in my process, you know, I, I had to reach out to a lot of people to get help, and you know, young farmers as well. And, you know, different organizations. I, I probably reached out to everybody on the planet when I, you know, but, you know, I was able to get through. That, that's the bottom line. I don't like to talk about those aspects of it because I can tell people all the, uh, the communication gaps that I had and that way, you know, they don't have to do it. And they get get the information of what they're looking for. Cause you know I mean? In, in their defense and everybody's defense, communication is the problem. And communication could be on both ends. You know, people go in and they ask questions but they're not asking the right questions. Or somebody is not responding or understanding something on that end or whatever it is. So, I mean, just, that's kind of about it as far as my experience. Rachel, would you like to add anything? Thank you for your help, Shakira, mm -hmm. <laughs> and young farmers. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> yes, of course, we're here. So what I am getting is be prepared, get your numbers right. Go in with your, your market prices, who you're selling it to, have contracts, and plan for your personal expenses. So what he was mentioning, you know, when you go in, you're applying as an entity, even, they will take into account your business structure, your business expenses, but they also look at the individual as well. So they want to make sure that you have enough to cover your personal living expenses and the farm business. So that's something to look into and consider. Um, if you have personal debts, that will be um, taken into account. So thank you for bringing that up, uh, Stu. I appreciate that. Yeah, it is one thing. So just know market value is, can, can be in a little of a contract. So if you want to go and start saying that you don't make more or higher than market value, you're going to need a contract in play in order to satisfy that need. So you can just don't worry about that. Just base your whole business. So market value, because you can go and then you'll see what amounts that you need to produce in order at market value to, to break even. Once you get that break even point, you can go in and start doing things. But for the purpose of the loan, you want to set yourself at the lowest baseline to set yourself up for success. Okay. That's it. Sorry. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Um, Tim, could you please share about your experience and if you had any barriers you had to overcome? Okay, yes, I would be more than happy to share with you my experience. It was very, it took me 18 months. I think I went through every aspect of getting a loan approved from the denial to mediation process and all the way up to the federal court system and filing a, um, a case and finally getting the judge to override the loan officer, a loan officer decision on my loan. So it took me 18 months to get, get approved. Um, it was a very complicated application looking back at it because I was applying for three different type loans, ownership loan, uh, the equipment loan, and operation loan. I, by looking back, I should have just done one loan and got that through instead of all three at the same time. To complicate my application, I was going from a transition plan from a existing family farm to my own operation, a separate entity. So my plan was all conceptual. It wasn't actual, tangible, and that created a, a, a lot of issues for the loan officer. And it had a, a lot of issues with his assessment on my risk and, and my cash flow and, and all of that nature. So I had stumbling blocks throughout the three different type loan programs to answer it, and that's why it took so long. Um, I think looking back at it, I'm currently enrolled in the FSA farm school. I would recommend anyone in your local area, if they, if your FSA office offer a 
farm, school, go to it. Because um, the gentleman before me mentioned the, you know, the cash flow, uh, how they analyze uh, your income, how they take that out of consideration. It's a totally different application process. Uh, I, you know, if you know that up front, how they look at your Schedule F, how you look at your, how they determine your eligibility. If you are familiar with all that up front, it will help make, make your process a lot easier and you will know exactly what they're talking about. If you've done a lot of business, a lot of loans, uh, it's totally different, different terminology. The loan officer doing a, a risk assessment and that's where my biggest issue were and that's where my uh, denial for my loan was based off of the risk assessment, and that created a lot of issues because it was a lot of interpretation of, of how he, the loan officer, felt versus how I felt about it. So the, I think if you prepare yourself up front, understand the language of, of the USDA, their process, uh, their manuals, their handbooks they use, how they make their decision, uh, there's a lot more subjectivity in it. So if you, if you know that up front, you'll know how to uh, approach the entire process. Um, so looking back at it, uh, it took 18 months, and it was a long, arduous 18 months along the way. So, um, but now everything is good. Thank you. Oh, I'm grateful that that worked out. I mean, many farmers would get discouraged along that process. And some of them might have buyers that are not willing to wait that long. So I guess you were fortunate enough that it was a family property that was being transferred over. Um, but could you tell us a little bit about what kept you going through the process? Why didn't you just quit? I, I well, you know, being a being a raised on the farm, you have to have a resolve, and and I believe that. Uh, I had went through commercial banks prior to, and I started looking at some of the things I had learned from what they were saying about, you know, why they wouldn't do it, and that they introduced me to USD. I had no idea about it. So they introduced the loan officer from the private bank, introduced me to the programs, and said I would probably be better off uh, going through that program and, and applying that way. So I had met a lot of the eligibility requirement, and I was comparing their process to the commercial bank process. And I think what kept me going is uh, it was just a matter of I knew I was going to do it. It was a matter of, you know, what kind of interest rate I was going to get, what kind of program, what kind of um, payment back program I was going to get. And I was looking at different kind of investment investors to make it happen. So it was uh, once I was aware of the benefit of using USDA, and some of the benefit of the program, I was dead on. I'm, I'm going to do whatever it takes, get through this process, because once you get through that process, it opens your doors up to a lot more avenue. Because uh, the key to me is having an uh, operating loan. Uh, it's very difficult to get an uh, operating loan to operate throughout that, that production cycle so that you don't have to worry about the funding that you need with no income coming in from that operation. So that aspect of it, and that piece of that program um, really made me stick with getting uh, go through the whole process because I felt that over the years, having the ability to do an operating loan would definitely make my farming operation a lot successful. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Tim. So thank you for all of that advice and steps to, to take and prepare. I know the interest rates are lower than um, the other market uh, prices we find in the, in the banks. And it is um, flexible, the terms that you get with the FSA. So in the end, you know, there, there are some great benefits. It's worth the time that it takes to complete these loans, even if it takes longer. Um, can, another can I question. Share, can I share? Oh, yes. Can I share please. one more benefit that I didn't know uh, until I closed on the loan? Their annual payment. And, you know, I was prepared to make monthly payment. You, you make one payment a year, and no one told me that. And that was like a blessing in disguise because you can you can uh, utilize that capital elsewhere, and they give. You don't have to worry about it every month. Where you're gonna, how you're gonna make those payments. So 
that annual payment aspect was worth it all. It's making that one payment a year on those different, those different three different loans. Yes, that's that's key. Thank you for pointing that out. They are annual, and um, that gives you a whole season to try and make up and and gather a payment. So yes, thank you. We're gonna um go to a, another question here. Is um passing on some knowledge. What do you wish you would have known, or what would you have done differently? if you were applying for the first time so we'll pass this to matthew and get some feedback from him about this well um the, the length of time uh, i knew it was gonna it was gonna take a few months but i didn't know it was gonna take nine months to finish it um i'm the total process from like looking for a property to, to almost close in on it now, <laughs> it's, it's been close to a year. Um, a big problem I had was I didn't know it was gonna take that long. I, I didn't plan for that. And when I went into escrow um, to take that property I wanted to purchase off the market, I mean, the property owners came to agreement that they would give me six months and they were okay with that. It had been on the market for a while. Um, and now we're eight months into that growth and it became very stressful um, going back and forth um, with the property owners, real estate agents, and, and the FSA loan officer trying to explain, you know, uh, you know, they, they're getting very impatient and, and then they're thinking about, you know, just not doing the deal with me and just trying to sell it to somebody else. And, um, so that would be stressful. Um, the other one is I would, uh, there's, there's some upfront costs involved in it in, in buying a property with FSA because unlike a bank where you go in and you say, hey, I wanna buy a, a, a home or a property, um, how much am I approved for? It, it doesn't work like that with the FSA. You've gotta come in and say, I've got, I've got this contract, uh, I'm gonna buy this land, or this land in a house or this land and I'm gonna build a house. That's what we're gonna do. Um, and it costs money to to put that that and to you know have blueprints uh, ready to show the FSA this is what we want to build. Uh, so we were we were a little unprepared uh, for those costs, which was a total of about five thousand dollars for us. So we had to get a little loan out to uh, to pay for all that stuff to get this loan. Um, done. Um, just ask for more time um, on escrow. Uh, I would have probably asked for nine months to 12 months um, to finish the process, to finish closing. Um, and that's, it can sometimes be difficult to find a property owner that's uh, willing to wait that long. But um, I think one way to, to help the property owners, like you tell them, hey, call the FSA. It's a totally legitimate loan process. Um, the odds of getting the loans are good, um, specifically for farming and ranching. The, the people that we were buying it from, they've been ranching there for a long time, and they were excited that we wanted to continue farming and ranching on that property. So that's one of the reasons they have helped us and, and have stuck with us through the process. So. Um, I guess those are some of the things I would have done differently. Um, okay, thank you, Matthew. Okay. Yes, so you might need to go into the loan with some cash, but also um, just to note some of the loans, most of them you are a 0% down payment. So if you can come up with some to cover, maybe I think there's an appraisal cost as well, a credit report cost. So just factor those in as before you go in. So we'll, this is our, uh, go ahead. Interrupt you. Um, we, like for instance, if you're buying a property or you're buying a property with a house, you need to take the time to do not just account for how much it costs, but again, your, your taxes, yeah. your closing costs, your appraisal, um, uh, the title transfer, um, that way you can work it all into the loan 
and uh, you don't wind up with out of pocket expenses. Thank you for bringing it up. So closing can be worked into the loan, closing costs. All right, Rachel and Stu, um, what's your advice or what would you give to yourself if you were doing this over or to other farmers? I said a lot of it on the first time, but you know, just it, it's it, it's not as difficult as you think. It's just really a lot, a lack of communication and differences between uh, this kind of loan versus the other loans you've had all your life. Um, and the pricing is a big thing. I had a nine month thing, but I had to go through two uh, appeals. So uh, that's kind of, kind of took me nine months. This one is moving a lot more efficient. Uh, a lot of my time frames are going to be based upon appraisals. We are like 30 to 45 days for appraisals out here right now. Um, let's see, what else, what else? Uh, you think anything? I just wish that like we had known more about the process and we're really grateful that young farmers helped us because it's it's very stressful. It's very stressful because like we all need farms or we need water or we need like support. And so when you just your your emotions and everything and I like I get but like when I hear it on other people's calls or when I'm on USDA calls and I can hear the stress in the farmer's voice, it I don't like it because these are things that can be prevented, you know? Oh, uh, yeah. You know, uh, one thing I say is just be open mm -hmm. to a change. You know what I mean? I, I've seen like people be battle and, and go over stuff over the price that they can sell something for. And they're not looking to satisfy the need of the loan. They're being stubborn talking about, I can sell it for this though. All right, so that is five, it's five dollars a pound. Okay, so all right, if I can only get five dollars a pound, I mean, I'm gonna have to sell 10 more. My numbers will come right. It means my volume up, you know, that's the whole break even thing. How much do I need to sell at what price? And then that's when it comes down to, yeah, you, he already promised you would buy it, but your business plan is going to be based off something different. And then if you yield more at the end of the day, man, that, that's good. You get out of debt faster or fund another project or whatever it is. But it's just, you know, this they need what they need. And that's not a lot of their things aren't actually going to be negotiable. Some are, some aren't. The one thing that you're going to find is the most difficult thing is the 150% collateralization. You're not going to get around that. So if you got, and you know, basically I, I, I've learned is more of the land. So when it comes to land and agricultural land, if you have more 150% collateral, but collateral is not required. So, you know, those pretty much the things. Well, I mean, he just means if you don't have it, then you don't. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's up to if you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for all that good advice that we need to hear going in there. So it might be a long process. You might get stressed. You might have to go back again. But we have, uh, thankfully, these organizations here that we're all here together and experienced to help. So please reach out to Young Farmers. Please reach out to Rafa USA. As we can see, we have three examples of those who have gone through this process and they have been successful. And we're so grateful to have them here sharing their experiences with us. We're gonna open the time up now for some questions. Um, we'll have Miss Ebony read questions that we have coming in. All right, so um, I'm just going to, to start. Um, oh, you got it? All right. Yeah, uh, so there is a question from Facebook. Um, I have had lenders deter me from applying for USDA, applying to the USDA for land for purchase and build. Would there be a contact or another farmer who I can connect with who has done this? So that's a question from Facebook. That seems like, well, we can definitely assist with those um, applications, but we know we have right here, Matthew, like um, you were talking about if you're gonna, purchase and build, you need blueprints or, or plans? So, yeah, so we first we found the property and and 
we went back and forth so many times in our head, like, should we, should we just buy the land? Should we buy the land and, and try to build something? Um, are we going to have enough time to do both? Um, and, and, and what I learned was if I would, if I wouldn't, if I would have gone back um, later to try to build a house there, I would have had to get a separate loan, a second loan. So we decided just bite the bullet, take the time, um, go to a home builder, uh, get some plants and, and present them both in, in the loan, which would be like, it's part of the uh, farm ownership loan. You can also have um, uh, home construction or home build uh, uh, in there as well. As long as you're under their $607,000 uh, limit uh, uh, for a farm ownership loan. Um, but again, there was there were some costs and it's going to depend on what home builder you go to. But yeah, you, you do you will have to, it was it was considered a down payment uh, on, on the house to get the blueprints. So um, you can do you can do both in, in a farm ownership. Loan. And uh, so we're super excited to, to start the, as soon as the, the appraisal is finished uh, to, to start construction. Thank you, Matthew. Next question. Uh, there's a uh, question in the chat. <laughs> I was about to say there's a farm in the chat. Excuse me. <laughs> um, uh, it was directed to Shakir. Can the farm apply as an LLC? And if so, does the owner's citizenship, citizenship status matter? Citizenship slash immigration status. Yes, the you can apply as an LLC. You would have to present your articles of incorporation and your um, your bylaws, which state who has which members have authority to enter into loans, and each member does need to meet the USA citizenship or legal resident status. Awesome. Um, this isn't a question, but it's a comment. Um, it's from Gloria Joy Muhammad. Um, she is currently looking for farm apprenticeships slash fellowships. So any of you farmers uh, on the call, if you are doing apprenticeships or fellowships uh, for folks, um, she did put her email in the chat. It's GloriaJoyMohammed at gmail.com. Thank you so much, Gloria, for being on. Um, I'm going to continue scrolling uh, through the questions. Um, let me see here. Oh, and thank you, Lisa, for, Lisa has really answered the majority of these questions um, in the chat. Uh, there was uh, just, if you can just say, uh, there was a question about are urban farms eligible for SSA loans? Um, can you talk about that as well? I know Lisa answered it in the chat, but since we're alive, can you just answer it for our folks also on Facebook, Shakira? Can you tell me again what question? Um, how does uh, the SSA loans work for urban farming, urban farms? Oh, you're back on mute, Shakira. Thank you. FSA doesn't make a distinction between, um, say, for urban farms or bigger farms. You, They are mostly concerned if you're farming for a profit. So you could be in a quarter acre lot or, or smaller. They just want to see that you are producing. If you have any expenses related to your operation, that's a good sign that you're um, producing. If you have purchased seeds or let's say compost or any supplies, they're gonna see, oh yes, this is a legit operation. You're farming for profit. So they don't make a distinction between the size. If you're urban rural, they just wanna make sure that you are a producer. That's right. Otis, is there anything? Yeah, you wanna add anything? Current farm is, a, is an urban farm. Yeah. You get a, um, a farm number from the FSA, and after that, we're able to, to go to NRCS and apply for some of their uh, firms, even even as an urban farm. Right, right. And so um, most places now, I think, um, I don't know if every state is doing it, but, you know, NRCS now has a urban farm conservation uh, program now. So just like EQIP is for, for the regular Farmers for the urban farmers, they have their own conservation practices too. So make sure you guys take advantage of that if you're doing urban farming. 
Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, there's a lot of other resources, so reach out to NRCS as well and look out for that urban farming program. All right, um, we have a question from Maura Russell. Um, what available resources are there out there that helps to determine market value? Right, so um, yeah, there are, there are several uh, resources you can go to. Um, FSA uh, offers a a uh, a commodity list with with those prices on it, um, as well as you can go to your local extension web page um, as well, and you can pull those up too. It's called a budget. Uh, it's an enterprise budget, and that'll have the prices for that'll have your market prices as well as your average on your fertilizer. You know your lime and all that stuff will be compiled to that list too. And you can also look up whatever, um, all the details for whatever crop it is that you're doing. If you're doing livestock or if you're doing uh, forages, you know, hay and all that stuff, um, you can find all that there. Thank you. See, I noticed uh, for the American Marketing Services, that's a quick resource I go to many times myself to check the market rates. They have retail rates, um, terminal rates for wholesale and, and shipping rates too for those specialty crops, even for organic. That's what my go-to for organic prices. Right. All right, uh, let me scroll through. We have 10 new messages. <laughs> They're coming in really quickly. Okay. Uh, there was a question for Gloria, what state are you in? Uh, I see that she responded. Thank you so much, Letitia. Um, will there be a recording of this meeting sent out to those who are here today? Oh, that's, I should probably answer that. <laughs> Shakira, I don't know why I just looked at you. Um, I think we can uh, send, a, send a re an edited recording out. Um, I don't think that should be a problem. Um, Make sure, uh, I know everyone, uh, make sure that you did uh, complete the registration link um, so that we have your email address. Okay, let me continue to scroll through here. I just wanna mention, um, if you're hanging in there, I know we have a few minutes left. We do have a poll. We'd like to get some feedback from y'all so we can plan more um, webinars like this and see how we can better assist you. So. Please stick around for that poll so we can get some feedback and continue to provide some services for y'all. And the poll has been launched. Yeah, I, I'd like to add too, Mr. Mr. Uh, Washington just added, I, I, I put it in the chat. He says that FSA has 17 different uh, committees now to deal with urban ag. So if you're doing urban ag, you should be able to get that help. You should be able to get that assistance. Thank you. All right. Um, as we are getting ready to wrap up, um, as people are doing the poll, uh, Shakira, Lisa, Otis, uh, do you have any announcements that you would like to share of anything that you have coming up? I did put into the chat uh, just a link to a recent webinar that we had, um, which was also an introduction on NRCS programs, um, which was a really great overview if if you are just completely new to NRCS um, to get a sense of what that agency is and what they can do for you and, and maybe ways to get started. Um, so I encourage people to take a look at that. Um, but otherwise, I just wanted to uh, thank all the farmer panelists that joined today and were sharing their experiences. And it's really helpful to hear you know, how it actually happens in, in, in practice. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and then I'm going to open it up to our former panelists, Rachel, Stu, Timothy, uh, Matthew. Uh, do you have uh, anything coming up on your farms that you would like to share with all of us farmers and beginning farmers and soon-to-be farmers on this call 
um, or a live on Facebook? I have something. Okay. I'll go ahead. Oh, I'll go. go. Ahead, um, uh, thank you. Um, so we have our Small Minority Farmer and Ranchers Conference coming up. It's going to be on May 6th, and we're actually holding it at our processing facility. So then uh, this is our second year, so that way people can see the first year we talked about the farming programs and how they work. This year they can actually come see how they work. We're going to be taking um, the farmers through organic certification. We're going to be having people um, who've been through our urban to rural, this is with our nonprofit, um, people who've been through our urban to rural farm transition program um, speak. And then we're also having cultural dancers and featuring our meat um, with chefs. So it's going to be a really special event um, and we'll, we'll let everybody know about it some more, but um, signups will be coming out soon. So thank you guys very much. Um, if, and if people would like more information, what's your contact info for Stewart's Pastures? StuartPastures.us. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, were you about to say something? Okay. All right. I'm going to transition it back over to Shakira. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you all for being here and appreciate you um, coming out. I'm going to share my screen here and let you guys see our contact information if you want to jot it down. You can also um, find us on our organization website, which is young, uh, youngfarmers.org or Rafa USA. But I'm going to put our direct contact information up here. So if you want a, uh, technical assistance, uh, feel free to come in. Um, there we go. Hopefully you all can see that. There you have it. Please reach out to me. This is my... Um, my line, uh, 512-684-3564, extension 1. I can also receive text messages if you prefer to communicate through text or email. Um, this is Otis Wright's information here with Rafa USA. Um, our list is also available too. So um, we're here to reach out um, and invite you guys to reach out uh, if you want uh, technical assistance. Awesome. And also, um, once again, um, in addition to the TA, um, if you feel that you have experienced discrimination, either with um, the, your local FSA office or in RCS, please feel free to also reach out to us as well. Because once again, we do uh, work with farmers who have faced discrimination um, and help elevate those concerns up through the USDA. And so that's also something that a service that we offer to farmers as well. All right, Shakira, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to close us out. Thank you, Ebony. Uh, big thank you to our farmer panelists, Matthew, Rachel, Sue, Mr. Tim Davis. Thank you for being here and sharing your stories with us. And we wish you the best in your operations and all the exciting projects you have going on. And thank you, Otis and Lisa, for partnering with us on this um, collaboration. And we are here to assist. Please reach out. Don't be strangers. And we wish y'all uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank y'all. Peace. Okay. Thank you.